On Saturday, the 21st of November 1981, thousands of people descended upon the Treviso Istrana airport, located just above the iconic city of Venice in Italy. Ordinary citizens normally aren't allowed to enter an active military airbase, but today was a special occasion, because several Formula 1 teams were in attendance as well. Just a month after the end of the spectacular 1981 season, Brabham, Alfa Romeo and Ferrari took part in what can only be described as the best bonus round in F1 history. They wouldn't be racing against each other, as there were much bigger and much faster rivals to beat. The small collection of legendary manufacturers and their best drivers would battle against an entire Air Force squadron. Before the race, we must first talk about the cars, the Ferrari 126CK, Brabham BT49C and Alfa Romeo 179. The 126CK was Ferrari's first F1 car that wasn't naturally aspirated. It was powered by a brand new 1.5 litre turbocharged V6, a radical change from the massive 3 litre flat 12 that came before it. Having a smaller engine meant that there was more room for the Venturi tunnels that generated downforce and glued the car to the ground at least in theory. In reality, however, both the aerodynamics and the engine were an unreliable mess. Drivers Pironi and Villeneuve shared a total of 15 retirements throughout the season. However, in the rare moments that the engine actually worked, it turned the 126 into a rocket ship down the straights. What never worked was the aerodynamics. This, coupled with the immense amount of turbo lag, made the car an absolute disaster to drive. Despite the glaring issues, Gilles Villeneuve still managed to drag it to the top spot of the podium in Spain and Monaco in spectacular fashion. Villeneuve goes through! Fantastic! Gilles Villeneuve leads! While Ferrari focused on the engine and arguably neglected everything else, the Brabham was the opposite. The BT49C still used the old school but proven Cosworth DFE V8. Out of 18 teams that appeared in the 1981 season, 13 of them used the DFV. What set the Brabham apart from all the rest was its massive amounts of downforce. Designer Gordon Murray had all but mastered the dark art of ground effect and made sure the car was an absolute weapon in the corners. Various lightweight carbon parts were first in F1, and trick hydro-pneumatic suspension, new for the 1981 season, only made it faster. Nelson Piquet used it to win his first world champion title. Alfa Romeo was one of only two teams left on the grid still using a big and heavy V12 engine. But whereas the other one, the Lee J JS17, managed to get on the podium six times and even win a few races, the Alfa only managed to get on the podium once in the hands of Bruno Giacomelli in the final race of the season. Basic aerodynamics and an unreliable engine made the 179 mediocre at best. The team being Italian is probably the main reason for them getting invited for the Istrana race. Alfa Romeo, Brabham and Ferrari would be up against a squadron comprised of F-104 Starfighters, one of the most infamous fighter jets of all time. First built in the late 50s, the F-104 was made as a direct response to American fighter pilots who wanted a more specialized plane for high speed and high altitude situations. What they got was a purebred interceptor, capable of flying higher and faster than any other fighter jet in the world. It saw use in not only the US, but also served in NATO countries like Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Norway, Greece and many more. The space age design and performance was also useful for NASA, who used the plane for a number of high altitude tests and research. Throughout the years, the US and many of the other NATO countries started to further develop and modernize the F-104 into somewhat of a multi-role fighter and bomber. And although they succeeded in making it more capable, none of them fixed its major flaw low speed stability. The extremely small wings were terrible at generating lift. This meant that takeoff and landing procedures were more dangerous compared to other contemporary fighter jets. Only a few pilots in the world were capable of performing low speed heroics without fatal consequences. Interestingly, the Ferrari and the Starfighter were somewhat similar, as both were ill-handling beasts relying on high speed aerodynamics to keep pointing in a straight line. 
As for the race, the airplane and car would line up next to each other with the plane taking off from the runway and the car setting off from the parallel taxiway. They would then race to the finish line exactly one kilometer away. This distance was bargained for by Alfa Romeo's team principal as he argued any distance further than that would have given the Starfighters an easy win. Although the Starfighters were bound to have a slow initial acceleration of the line, its speed was bound to grow exponentially thanks to their, in car terms, massive 36,000 horsepower engine. The jets were also forced to only take off after the finish line. This meant that in some cases, if the plane was light enough and had enough speed, the pilots had to actively force their plane to the ground. A third and probably biggest balancing factor came unexpected as a dense fog rolled over the airport. Takeoff procedures were still possible, but on the off chance that the fog thickened, the planes were instructed to carry enough fuel in reserve to fly to a different airbase and land there instead, if visibility was too bad to attempt the landing back at Istrana. The first battle was between Bruno Giacomelli in the Alfa Romeo against Major Santa Croce. His plane was bound to be the heaviest of all as it was equipped with four auxiliary fuel tanks on the wings. The pre-race balancing act proved to be successful as Giacomelli managed to beat the Starfighter with just over a second to spare. Up next was the fan-favorite driver of the event, Gilles Villeneuve, against Lt. Martinelli, again in a Starfighter with four auxiliary fuel tanks. Contrary to Alfa Romeo and Brabham, who didn't do any changes to their cars, Ferrari had opted to completely remove the front and rear wing of the 126, as a means to drastically reduce drag on the car and in turn make it accelerate and drive even faster. Since the race was only in a straight line, they were confident the Venturi tunnels and the skill of Villeneuve alone would keep the car pointing in a straight line. The gamble paid off as Villeneuve absolutely demolished the Starfighter with a 3.5 second lead. The aerial opposition was starting to get more competitive as Nelson Piquet was up against a Starfighter that only carried two fuel tanks, flown by Major Dapos. Piquet would have to get an excellent launch as his Brabham was the least powerful car in the race. But this was the current F1 world champion, he knew what he was doing. Thanks to the brilliant Grand Prix style start, Piquet won his race with 0.81 seconds to spare. Giacomelli in the Alpha was up again, this time against Major Bono, again with the plane running two wingtip style fuel tanks weighing it down. Giacomelli improved from his previous run and completed the 1km sprint in 17.75 seconds, just half a second faster than the Starfighter. The Air Force had kept their best planes for last as Colonel Tenerello was now flying a Starfighter without any extra fuel tanks a potential risky move as the thick fog still hadn't cleared. The low drag modified Ferrari of Villeneuve was up once again for its toughest race yet. Villeneuve completed the sprint in 17.8 seconds, which was slower than his first one, but the somewhat lightweight Starfighter of Tenerello was still 1.2 seconds slower. Last but not least was Ricardo Patrese in what was probably one of the first times he ever got to drive the BT-49C, as he was Piquet's new teammate for the upcoming 1982 season. A trial by fire then, as he raced against Major De Vincenti in a Starfighter with again no extra fuel tanks. Clearly Patrese had to get used to the car as he set a time of 19.89 seconds, the worst time of all the cars. De Vincenti however had saved the Italian Air Force from complete domination as he set a time of 18.05 seconds, the best time of all jets. Overall the event was a resounding success. While the Starfighters didn't win, they did provide the thousands of fans present an amazing series of races. Most, if not all of them, were rooting for Gilles Villeneuve and got to see him fly down a runway with a fighter jet giving chase. A sight many of them will never forget. At the end of the day, Villeneuve had to be sneaked out of the airbase as his thousands of fans so desperately wanted a picture or autograph of their hero. Sadly, not even half a year later, Villeneuve died in a tragic accident during the qualifying of the Belgian Grand Prix in Zolder. A few years later, in 1989, the Italian Air Force gave Ferrari a special present commemorating the unique race and simultaneously paying tribute to Villeneuve. Instead of sending one of its retired F-104 Starfighters to the scrap heap, they donated it to Ferrari. But not before painting it in the typical bright Rosso Corsa red and changing its identification number from 447 to 427. The number 4 representing the 4th wing of the Italian Air Force and the number 27 being an obvious nod to Gilles Villeneuve's racing number in his final Formula 1 years. 
Still, to this day, it's one of the very first things you see when you drive into the central courtyard of the Fiorano test track, serving as the most unique statue and tribute to one of Ferrari's best F1 drivers.